uh, whether it was uh, the Red Heels and Julie Bishop or whether it was um, Kelly O'Dwyer's shock resignation where, you know, suddenly people are thinking, hang on a minute, there, there is an issue here and, and it's a, an issue that really needs to be front and centre and let's unpack it. So that's what we're going to do today. We've got uh, two elections, big elections this year, a state uh, New South Wales election and then a federal election. I wanted to ask each of you, how serious do you think this is? And by the end of the year, are we going to have more female politicians or fewer female politicians? Karina, do you want to start? Certainly. Um, I think that's perhaps a question that is, while it may be interesting, leaving that to the side for the moment, mm. will we have quality politicians? Will we have politicians of integrity, of honesty, politicians who represent their electorate and are ingrained in their community? Mm. I think when it comes to the ballot box, those are the real questions that voters will be focusing on. But do you not think so people much mind uh, that I mean, we're talking about the Liberal Party now with really a very low turnout of female politicians. I mean, that's I mean, stating the obvious to say there is a chasm of difference between Labour and Liberals now. Now, whether it's to do with their strategy or not, we can talk about that. Um, but do you think the electorate out there is beginning to think that uh, just on the numbers, this look is not working and it's not working for the Liberal Party? Well, I have to acknowledge Labour in terms of uh, focusing and framing the issue on one of lack of female representation amongst the Liberal Party. And that, I suppose, is a, a space where the Liberal Party really need to step up and, and say good quality representation is more than gender. Uh, and uh, that is perhaps something that has been lacking. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we do but want to... do you think it matters? As long as we've got good MPs, do you think it matters if there are 100% males? I mean, is it an issue at all for you? I think... It, uh, Personally, when I look at who is representing me, yeah. I don't look at their gender. I look at who they are as a person, what their character is, what they can offer in terms of uh, policy and driving that, their uh, intellectual capacity and contribution that they can make. Yeah. Um, I think if we are going to talk about identity politics, and I, I hate identity politics, so yeah. it's very hard to do so, but let's try it on for size. The way that Labor have framed this debate about uh, gender politics is one where they suggest, um, and very cleverly, that the, Labor, the Liberal Party are uh, somehow sexist because we don't have the same number of female representatives in Parliament. And if I do try on identity politics for yeah. size, uh, we could say the same about, well, hey, when we look at uh, female representat representation amongst Labor MPs, uh, well, what about women of colour? Is that something that should be looked at? Uh, what about people of colour across the board when it comes to Labor's representation. And therefore, if there is a lack of people of colour who are um, on our parliamentary benches mm -hmm. on the Labor side, does that mean that they're racist? Okay. Well, I would suggest Christina, not. Do you, do you want to pick up on that? Because, I mean, look, this is the, this is the political story, obviously, Liberal versus Labor at the moment. Um, and so I thought I'd knock it on the head straight away. Well, Labor didn't raise bullying allegations against the Liberal Party. Linda Reynolds, a Liberal MP, and Lucy Gachui, a Liberal MP, and, and uh, Julia Banks, a then Liberal MP, they raised those allegations. You know, Labor hasn't been the one pointing out that the Liberal Party's target of 50% representation by 2025 isn't going to be met. Maurice Payne is pointing that out, and Julie Bishop is pointing that out. So these aren't, you know, this isn't something that, uh, that Labor has created. It's something the voices of liberal female MPs speaking out. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's not Labor's fault that we set in a, a, a quota in 1994 of 40% of our winnable seats being contested by women. But Christine, do, do you see that and as... And that's been successful. Yes, do you see that, that as the reason why there is now the difference? Because, I mean, I'm sure you, you would acknowledge mm. that Labour is not a bullying-free zone. You know, I've had... Um, uh, one of the benefits of working at Sky News uh, was that um, I got to know <laughs> a lot of uh, liberal MPs and 
uh, people on the conservative side more than I did before. And you know, one of them explained to me that you know part of the problem with a quota within the conservative side is that you would be um, treated as a quota girl, which is Connie Fairavanti's words, um, and, and you would be targeted because of that, and, and that there were so many other odds stacked against you that they didn't want that. And I, I thought about that. I thought, you know, maybe early on in the early 90s there were some issues around that. But you know, yeah, we play politics hard. I'm from the New South Wales, right? We play it harder than anyone. Um, but you know, quota baiting is just not a thing. Um, yeah, yeah, no, no party is free of these types of challenges. But to blame Labor for the eruption of claims that have been made by Liberal female MPs, I think is a, a bit far. And, you know, um, sure, uh, Carino raises the question of whether you should have quotas in other areas. I want to say two things about quotas. One, um, I don't care if the Liberal Party has them or not or adopts whatever strategy they want. I'm not here to tell the Liberal Party how they should you know, address their issues. I can only say that Labor adopted a quota system and it worked. Um, Quota systems don't put in place, um, they don't deny people of merit a spot to give it to a person without merit. They force an organization to look for merit in places they haven't been looking before. That's what they do. And so it, it was a change of behavior that came about. Um, secondly, sure, you can talk about quotas for other portions of the population. And, and maybe in time, various organizations, corporate Australia or political parties might do that. I would point out, you know, um, amongst our uh, female MPs, we've got people like Linda Burney and Anne Ali and Lisa Singh. You know, it's not as if we don't have people mm -hmm. of color uh, in our, in our, um, our um, uh, parliamentary delegations and you know I won't bore right. you with the list of firsts that have come from the Labour Party when it comes to a range of ethnic and, right. and cultural backgrounds. Eugenie can I bring you in here because uh, we'll come back to quotas in a minute but how do you see what's been going on particularly in the Liberal Party I mean if we go back to Don's party wasn't there that line that the woman didn't when this was in the 70s the woman didn't want to join Labour because it reminded her of sort of sweaty singlets and you know that was when the CWA was out there and 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 uh, you know women were really driving the Liberal National Party. W what's what's changed? Mm. Well, that's a really interesting question. I, I think the problem is political life comes with high trade-offs and and we can't deny those trade-offs exist. It requires a lot of politicians now, long working hours, um, a lot of nasty attacks from the public, intense media scrutiny. So in some ways, and, and arguably it's worse than it was, but was decades ago in mm. terms of scrutiny and public abuse. So in a way it's not surprising that that talented, capable women, and men for that matter, are, are put off mm. the prospect of entering politics. But going back to whether whether the low representation of women matters, I, I think to the general Australian public, yes, I think it does. Mm. I think they do look at the low representation of women in the Liberal Party, and there's, and there's a question mark for mm. them there. Having said that, I think we have to be careful about overstating um, the consequences because um, polling shows that primary support for the coalition is is similar among men and women and it's the same for the Labor Party. So I think Karina's right that um, people primarily look at what their politicians stand for and their policies rather than their gender. And what do you think about trying to address this? Mm. You know, let's look for the solutions with quotas or at least targets for mm. the Liberal Party? Mm. Look, I, I am quite uh, cautious about the prospect of, of quotas because, yes, they will boost the number of women in the parliament, mm. but they won't necessarily address some of the underlying problems, um, which arguably are more important. But are we at a stage where important. this is actually the bigger problem at the moment for the Liberals? Again, I, I, do, I don't necessarily subscribe to that. I think the lack of women is actually symptomatic of, of the underlying problem of a lack of meritocracy mm. in the way that candidates are pre-selected. Mm. And the lack of women is, is a consequence of that. Rina, I just wanted to ask you as well about the, 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 the structure or the difference in the structure of the Liberal Party and the Labour Party. I mean, even if you had quotas or, or, or targets, um, the Liberal Party is a grassroots organisation. So how, even if you put them in, how would that 
how would that actually work? I mean, it's, it's a sort of a Labour Party is sort of almost structured to be able to deliver this from the top. You know, that you can see how that works pretty efficiently. Um, it would actually be quite hard to put in to the Liberal Party, wouldn't it? Well, within the structures of the Liberal Party, from its very outset at the founding of the party, um, Sir Robert Menzies and Dame Elizabeth Couchman, they came together and uh, particularly uh, Elizabeth Couchman, she ensured that there would be uh, gender balance amongst positions of leadership within the Liberal Party and that has uh, been from the outset up to today. We have a Liberal Women's Council, we don't have a men's Liberal Council or anything like that. There is a lot of support for women in the party, training programs. I've been a beneficiary of many, many training programs mm -hmm. of the Liberal Women's Council that are solely offered to women um, and supports on how you might uh, position yourself for leadership positions and the like. Mm. Uh, but when we're talking about the issue of quotas, mm. that is inherently problematic because women are not joining political parties at the same rate as men are. Why not? They are vacating the political space and that, that I think is the root issue that needs to be uh, really addressed. When I talk to women of my age, I'm 38, mm -hmm. um, about whether they might get involved in politics, they say that they're you know, too busy with their job or they're too busy with their families. Um, and that's really a loss, not just for uh, politics when it comes to representation on the parliamentary benches, but real politics is played out also through the party system itself, policy development, um, having a voice, putting forward motions that then would but drive this is what's happening when you're looking policy. for candidates for pre-selection. Absolutely, but within our own par party itself, we have a lack of women from the outset. Mm. So, so how does I think that's something that we need to encourage. How does the process work? Uh, so, uh, for example, yeah. Higgins at yes. the moment. A pre-selection process is entirely fair in terms of uh, women or men standing. There is no uh, uh, preference on gender. Everybody has the same opportunities when it comes to pre-selection. And ultimately, it's up to a broad range of delegates who yeah. select and therefore select on merit, which is what I think is really important when it comes to the question of whether you impose quotas. Because at the moment in the Liberal Party, uh, we generally, in most divisions, certainly in the Victorian division, we have plebiscites. So we have hundreds of members uh, who really do represent the community uh, who cast their vote on who the candidate should be. But you're saying Where that you women, aren't, women aren't stepping up. True. Now, is that, uh, Christine, is that, is that the case in, in Labor? I mean, and, well, sorry, clearly it's, clearly it's not. Um, <laughs> or, or is the structure of the Labor Party once again uh, able to deliver your outcome uh, in, in, in a more successful way? Well, first I'd say every state has a different, slightly different way of doing it. But yes, uh, ultimately, uh, the change that we've seen in the Labor Party over the past three decades has really come about as a result of both agitation from the grassroots and leadership from the top. Um, requiring uh, certain outcomes uh, and changing culture and expectations. And that has that has played itself out in so many different ways, whether it's mentoring programs for female candidates, whether it's changing the way that branches operate so meetings can be held at more flexible times, mm -hmm. or whether it's um, uh, uh, changing um, uh, rules about pre-selections, how they are conducted. Some states might have a more centralized approach to ensure that they meet the quota. Some might have a, New South Wales has a loading system. Uh, it's just a different approach taken by each state. Uh, but um, it is, I you are right to point out uh, that, uh, that, it, that change is not going to come lasting change. And I think that was your point, Eugenie, that there's, got, there's both cultural and outcome um, changes that have to occur. And I think you, there, it is now, I would say, uh, within the Labor Party, just a completely accepted um, that uh, we need to have structures, processes, culture that supports a diverse group of candidates coming forward. Uh, that's why you know, where we are, but that's only come after several decades of, of this change trying to be implemented and, and now successfully having been done so. Eugenie, would you, if could I put to you that part of the difference in Labour is that they now have a critical mass <laughs> of women there, which perhaps and it's d been done forcefully through um, targets, quotas, which perhaps now helps them 
uh, if, you know, in terms of now getting the sort of candidates more on a merit base, if you like, um, but they've had to get over that hump. Oh, th there's no doubt that, that the use of quotas in the Labor Party has, has changed the party um, and has boosted the number of women. So in a way, the qu quotas do what you want want them to do, which is to boost the number of women elected to parliament. In terms What of about the downside though? Can you see the downside? I'm the, the criticism about quotas is that you don't get the, the right candidates with the right experience um, and it can indeed backfire. Do you see that? I, I think we have to acknowledge that quotas come with their limitations and I think quotas won't necessarily achieve several objectives and one of those is 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 diversity in, in the types of uh, elected representatives we have in the parliament. So a great example is a recent report by per capita uh, left-leaning think tank showed that 40% of our federal MPs have political backgrounds. They're, they've previously worked as political staffers or, or experience in the uh, executive ranks of the party. So again, we can talk but about- But is that true for the women? So, interestingly <laughs> enough. Well, again, for the general public, they look at mm. both political parties and I think it's apparent to them that that on both sides of politics, factions still play a role in mm. determining who gets pre-selected. Mm. Um, um, they do see the same sort of person coming up the ranks, men and women. So, yes, quotas will boost the number of women, but mm. it won't necessarily address some of the issues around the general diversity of the Co parliament. Karina, going back to so, sort of solutions, um, Eugenie mentioned factions there. Is factions one of the reasons why women are, 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 are being reluctant to s put themselves forward? Look, I think in terms of the idea of introducing quotas, I think uh, factionalism will more so rear its head and have uh, significant unintended and negative consequences. Mm. Uh, but is that a problem in, in, in the pre-selection process, that women are concerned about um, mm, no, factional influence? No, I don't, I don't feel that talking to pre-selection mm. candidates and having been a, a candidate myself for pre-selection, certainly that's not something um, particularly that is So what are they concerned about? What's, what's the issue? Uh, in terms of putting a hand up for yeah. pre-selection, well, there are there are fewer women in the party. So uh, the issue is that there's a smaller talent pool of women from which to pre-select for from the first place. Mm. Um, a study uh, by Lawless and Fox in 2012 in the US identified that um, of people who were tapped on the shoulder to say suggest that they put their hand up for pre-selection, mm -hmm. uh, around 50% of women said that they hadn't considered it before they had been tapped on the shoulder. Only 25% of men said they hadn't considered it before. So men, when they join a political party, more so than women, are positioning themselves for a pre-selection run. They are networking, they are getting out to functions and meeting people and potential mm. delegates. Women aren't thinking about that when they get involved in in party politics. What so they're on the back what foot What about from a, the a strategy uh, like the sort of strategy that David Cameron uh, put in in Britain uh, for the Tories uh, when he was struggling with the idea of women in um, 2005, I think. Um, he had something called the A-list, which uh, was actually a, a, a long list, uh, hundreds of, of uh, not just women, but it was really a vehicle for, for getting women in. And the A-list, they, they had this list of, of people and you then had to do certain things for the party, whether it was recruit or uh, raise money or um, uh, you know attend functions, and that would put you up on the list and, and then that would uh, give you a profile, give people an idea of how to push this forward. And it was remarkably successful in getting women in. Well, going back to factionalism, I would say who is in control of this list? I think that's something that would really need to be considered. Uh, we do know when uh, quotas are in, in place that that uh, gives rise to more influence from party leaders to uh, have a say over who the candidate would be. Certainly, uh, you would see power brokers, and this does occur, uh, deciding that this is the person we're going to get behind because uh, then we'll be able to stack out the parliament and um, be able to have the numbers to put someone in as prime minister. Yes. These are things that are uh, unintended consequences, whereas if you have a plebiscite where members get to have a say at a pre-selection, where candidates are pre-selected on merit, that is largely stamped out. Yes, factions still play a role, but mm. not to the same extent if you institute 
uh, things like quotas which open up the part parties yes. to essentially stacking and putting in people for right. uh, other purposes. Christina, can I just shift uh, gear a bit? Uh, now you have been both a state premier, mm. you're now a senator, mm. federal senator. Mm. Um, your personal experience mm. of being a woman, your mother, um, being a woman in politics, mm. how hard is it to juggle everything? <laughs> My kids were two and four when I first got elected. They were uh, nine and 11 when I became premier. Uh, so uh, this is what I say to um, uh, young labor women when I speak to them about a potential political career and this idea that you can have it all. You can't have it all. You know, newsflash. Uh, and yes, uh, my husband and I made some pretty clear decisions when I decided to put my hand up for pre-selection in 2002. And you know, one of those was if I got elected, he would take a backward step in his job and go to part-time, uh, change tack in his career. And he pretty much did that for 10 years uh, until I left politics at the state level. Um, but I you know, reflect upon the fact that you know, uh, the media used to try and do these articles, saying, oh, she's a mother, she does the laundry, she runs the state budget. I said, no, she doesn't do the laundry. <laughs> You know, um, and when I was, uh, there was a point when I was premier, I would not have known my children's names. I could have told you anything you wanted about the state GDP, but I could not have told you, no, not their names, sorry, their teachers' names. I knew their names, <laughs> although occasionally I got them wrong. Um, I knew they didn't know their teachers' names. And if you'd stop me at a media conference and say, what are Daniel and Brendan's teachers' names? I would have said, oh, oh. ask their father. Um, yeah. So, so and you, were, you were premier? I was premier. But you were of a state. Yes. Now, if I'd said to you, you've got a two-year-old and a four-year-old and you're going into the lower house federally. Oh. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would not have been fun. And, you know, <laughs> my kids are now young adults. Um, they don't, one doesn't live at home, one's about to move out and, um, please God. And, um, <laughs> and um, I, I, they, but they don't need me in the way that they used to. And yeah. being a senator is far easier uh, than it would have been when they were much younger. And I don't know how some of the parents of young children do it. Uh, and yes, it would have an enormous strain on any family. I uh, mean, I'm just struck yeah. by the number, particularly sure. the number in the federal parliament of successful female MPs, sure. particularly the active ones, um, ministers and, and you know, yeah. it's secretaries or whoever, who are either, either don't have children at all or who've come into parliament once their kids have effectively moved out. Yeah, and look, people often point that out, particularly you look at Julia Gillard, but you know, look at our front bench, our most senior women, Tanya Plibersek, Penny Wong, Michelle Rowland, you know, they all have kids and young kids um, in, in some cases. Uh, well, I think, you know, somebody like Tanya Plibersek is your sort of absolute sort of poster, poster girl, isn't yeah. she, on that front? But I mean, sure. I, can, I can run through names and there are, there are a lot sure, of them on both sides of parliament who, who would support that, um, that position that actually it is enormously difficult to mm. your point of you can't have it all. So I would also make the observation and not that there is any parity yet on this I fully uh, endorse the notion that it's easier for a man with a wife than it is for a, a, a woman with a husband. Well it's, it's, I mean, sure. it's on their website but men go into parliament they need to get married have kids as soon as possible they're on their websites is yeah. the great big family so we're relating to the electorate. Women on the other hand have you know seem to be Coming, having to come at it completely the other way. Yeah, look, there's there's some truth to that. I, what I was going to point out is that people like Stephen Conroy and Tim Hammond and others have resigned from Parliament because they wanted to spend time with their children. It's not just women that this is no, affecting. Once a minister and da -da -da. well, yeah, but. Yeah. In, <laughs> Well, Tim Hammond was uh, hadn't been a minister yeah, yet. Tim he Hammond. was on the way to become one, yes, um, true. a sure thing. And so, uh, my I guess my point is that yes, parliamentary life, federal parliamentary life, is hard on families. And every family has to make a decision about how they're going to manage that. And in some cases, it'll be like, as Tim Hammond and Stephen Conroy and Kate Ellis and Kelly O'Dwyer have done, to say this is no longer sustainable. Mm. Others will continue to rely on grandparents and nannies and partners and things. Mm. You know, and 
it, but as I say to young women, I say two things. One, you're not going to have it all. Do not labor under some apprehension that this is all going to be magically possible. Uh, you are going to make sacrifices. When I became a minister, I gave up coaching my son's soccer team. You know, that was just a choice I had to make. Uh, but secondly, for example, um, but secondly, I say to young women, uh, if you are thinking about a career in politics and you want to run, have the conversation with your prospective partner, boyfriend, father of your children now or before you enter into that to say, this is what I want out of life and this is what it might mean and are you willing to support that? Because one of the biggest um, decisions that will have to be made to see women go into politics is the support of their families, just as it's been for men. Mm. I mean, men can only do the job. Scott Morrison can only do that job because his wife, Jenny, is able to, you know, pick up a lot of the slack at home. The same for Bill and Chloe. Mm. You know, Coco women are going to have to have those conversations as well yeah. with prospective fathers of their children. Eugenie, uh, let's come back to what the system can do to um, find a solution to getting more good women into politics. What do you think? Well, I'm reluctant to, to preach to p particular political parties because obviously they have different systems and the way they're structured. But I would say generally, and I dislike the term, but cultural change um, is very relevant here. I think I think all the ma both major parties um, need to do some work on that in terms of trying to be more open to, to a more diverse range of women. Um, and in an ideal world, I think I would like to see more uh, active headhunting of talented, capable women. <coughs> so me. it's okay for political parties to hire headhunters, go out and chase it, them down. Absolutely, yeah. from out and outside outside the political well, system. Jump in, Christina, if you don't. Well, I don't think you need to hire headhunters. I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, our general secretary, Kayla Murnane, first female general secretary of the Labor Party here in New South Wales, you know, has just made it a personal mission. She goes out and meets all the branch members and hunts out the women. You know, and so if you look at who's running in the state election, we have, you know, in a range of seats, women who've never run for parliament before and from a variety of different backgrounds, but it's yeah. because Kayla decided she knew they, they were out there in the party and she was just going to go find them. Yeah. So that's kind of internal headhunting, really. Well, so it if is, it's so not. You don't have to hire some external but, but, consultant. But you just have to yeah. <laughs> but, have but, a knowledge of who's out there. And, you know, Karina mm. makes an interesting point about whether or not there's enough women in the party. You know, I, I would say, back to that point, you have to look like a party that women want to join as well. And, you know, when you have people like Kelly O'Dwyer saying you're anti-women or Ann Sid Mollis saying she's being bullied and losing her she seat, well, she did. And when she <laughs> loses her seat and, you know, someone gets imposed from the outside, that doesn't send a message to women in the community that this is a party that you're welcome to join and have a cute future in. Okay, Karina, do you want to quickly come back on that? Yeah, look, I can't credit um, ideas for solutions to my own self, but the Queensland state president um, he mentioned uh, in particular that a, a lot of the difficulty is that separation from family mm. um, and for women in particular who uh, at perhaps thinking about entering a career in parliament when it is at a time when you are having children and yeah. it, it's the same in out there in the professional world as it is in the political world. When you have a baby, you take maternity leave, you come back, you may be part-time, your career starts stagnating, it may be on the rise, have babies stagnate. Yeah. Um, the same in politics. Okay. You well, may back, be to, back to Eugenie, sorry, because I was uh, um, wanted to ask you whether they're on that point about culture, mm. whether there are any lessons perhaps from the business community. Uh, we've just had the AICD's um, uh, news that they're touching 30% of women on boards now, um, which is a bit, you know a pretty big achievement. As I say, it'd be nice to to, to get the statistic of you know, the number of ASX 200 company directors, whether that's 30%, I don't think it's there yet because mm. there are lots of women uh, on on a multiple boards, several women on multiple mm. boards. Now, you obviously, you <coughs> can't do that as a politician and represent 10 seats, can you? Um, but equally, um, equally, are there lessons from the from business, from boardroom about cultural change? Mm. Mm. Oh, I think, I think in the general probably, 
Uh, probably yes. Um, in terms of the business community, you know, we have seen corporations move to more family-friendly policies, you know, um, for, for, for women's and, and a lot of corporations have you know, very, very good mentoring programs. So yes, there are, there are some general lessons I think the political parties could take from, from the way corporations mentor and um, So you talk about headhunting, anything else? <laughs> so, and, and I think the only other thing I would say is, is, is I agree with with both um, with the whole panel that it is difficult for women, um, especially when women have children, that there's so so much going on in their lives. So, I think a real barrier to women entering politics is that necessity to do the hard yards within a political party for 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 years to to provide service to the party. I I, I just question that. I think there are capable. Uh, qualified women outside political parties who would make excellent candidates and I don't know if we should always automatically think that every woman to be pre-selected has to have had 10 years experience in it within the political party yeah. because that's part of the the objective of broadening the pool of women who mm. could enter parliament. Well that's a great point to throw to the floor. Would anybody like to kick off with a question? Yes. Just we'll bring you a mic there. Thanks, yes. I usually have a loud voice. People don't have to have to one of these. This is really to get your thoughts, Christina. Mm. I'm a human resources professional, and in my opinion, using any type of gender quota or similar mechanism in isolation may not be sustainable. In industry, we use other tools, such as a candidate selection criteria, to establish the definition of merit. It, through this, we determine then whether a person, male or female, is up for the job. That way we have key indicators that tell us whether someone is suitable or not and whether they are likely to be successful. Of course, we would first have a consensus on what merit looks like. My question, Labor leaders have said publicly that they want to be the first government with more than 50% female representation in their ranks. However, the means to achieving that is yet to be tested at the polling booth. And that's the test that matters. Mm -hmm. So what other methods of labour used within your party, mm -hmm. along with female quotas, to follow through and ensure suitable pre-selection at the upcoming elections? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thoughts? look, that's a great question and I would just reflect too very briefly that um, when I was out of politics, I also worked at Macquarie Graduate School of Management with their Director of Gender Inclusion Program and looked at why women weren't being getting MBAs at the same rate as men and many of the things you've just spoken about flesh themselves out and, and some of the things we strategies we implemented uh, including mentoring uh, including flexible work options including financial support um, we're all part of the answer so I acknowledge the point you're making uh, when it comes to um, to pre-selection processes yes the quota has been an important part of changing um, uh, the uh, broadening the pool of people we look at for potential pre-selection, and uh, you know, just as it is in the corporate world uh, when it comes, you know, when it comes to board appointments, or or it is in the political world that often people promote people like them, you know, and that's the easiest, simplest thing to do. So quotas were one about expanding, you know, who the pool of available candidates, what we what people might even consider uh, available, uh, before you got to the question of, of merit. Uh, but then we have put in place a range of things along the lines you've talked about, and I mentioned them earlier. We have a, a labor women's network. We have a labor mentoring, women's mentoring program, where we match women who have been experienced uh, in the party uh, in various roles to aspiring uh, women. Uh, we have a number of training, candidate training programs, uh, and we look at whether or not women have gone through those. So I'll give you one example. There's a woman that um, kind of fits your line of not everyone has to be in the party for 10 years. We've pre-selected in the seat of Deacon named Shireen Morris. And Shireen is a constitutional lawyer. Uh, she worked with Noel Pearson in the Cape York. Uh, she was you know, very instrumental on this statement from the heart, the Uluru statement. Uh, she, she went through one of our training programs and she joined the party and then when it came you know to the seat of Deacon she put her hand up and she we went through a whole interview you know 
process for the candidates. And in the end, she's now pre-selected. And amazingly, she may well win, <laughs> which would be quite an extraordinary okay. outcome for, uh, for Labour and Deakin. <laughs> and so um, right. you know, she has a chance. Uh, but my point is, my point is, uh, you know, it wasn't just about saying we have to have a, a pardon me, we have to have a vagina in this seat. Mm. Um, it is about saying, and look, that's how it crudely gets described. It's about saying we are, we need to broaden the pool of people we look at. My, my pre-selection happened in 2002. It followed the Hawk Rand review mm. from 2001, which not only said we need to have more women, but said we need a broader base of candidates with a broader range of backgrounds. Oh, and I'm, I was an yeah. at-home mother, and I don't think, had, absent that review, I don't think the Hawk Rand review would have sent the party yeah. looking for people like me. All right, Tom? Tina. Yes, Tina. Okay, Tina. <laughs> that doesn't always go down so well, Tom. Um, look, I'm just, I'm too, I'm almost exhausted. Thank you. I'm exhausted by the whole women in politics thing. I, I really am. I'm so exhausted by it. And uh, it's a huge topic about quotas and things, but since 1994, since um, Keating introduced quotas to the Labor Party, there have been eight federal elections. The Liberals have won seven nearly eight of them. So, um, you know, and the, and the reality is, young women of the Liberal Party, A, generally don't want to take the pay cut mm -hmm. of a politician, they're very successful young women, and really love spending time at home. So we've got some great women in the party, and when you can't go outside the party, you end up with a Julia Banks, and that didn't work so well. Mm. All right, uh, does anybody want to, Eugenie, do you want to pick up on that? Or just take that as a comment? I might just take that as a comment at the moment. Okay, yes, ma'am. A large elephant in the room in terms of uh, demographic imbalance, mm -hmm. in other words, there, which has not received the attention in Australia, which it may have done overseas, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm referring to ageism, mm -hmm. which interacts with yes. the gender issue very much. Mm -hmm. uh, that ironically, the generation which had huge legal discrimination when young is now facing discrimination and are being expected to retire from the public square yes. when they have 25 years of perhaps active cognitive life ahead. How many federal politicians in the major parties are over the age of 70? And yet contrast that with Trump, Hillary Clinton, John McCain, <laughs> Bernie Sanders, Nancy Pelosi, age 78, mm. and yet women, or and perhaps men, yeah. are being quietly told, but what about your age? Mm. Do you think that? Uh, and this do, is do you think a real that's true? Issue. Do you think that's true, Karina? And because I, I was going to say one of the one of the ways that women are getting back in is after their children have gone. I mean, you are seeing older female politicians now, aren't you? Uh, indeed, and I, I absolutely agree with your point. The, I mean, we talk about how do you increase female representation on boards, for example, and um, that's been a question. Now the Australian Institute of Company directors say it is about cognitive diversity. And I think that is what it's about when it comes to our political sphere as well, to make sure that we have a diverse range of opinions, of background, so that c people can contribute to policy for the betterment of our nation. That's what it's all about. Mm. And having that kind of diversity is really, really important. Mm. Uh, when we even talk about gender quotas, I mean, ultimately, I think the elephant in the room will be what is gender. I come from Victoria, the most <laughs> left-wing state in this country, and the, the Labor government there have pushed uh, radical gender theory through the schools. Uh, they're teaching children, so the next generation are going to be graduating school believing that gender is not binary, that there are multiple genders. Mm -hmm. How does that fit in with the debate that uh, gender quotas should be binary. Well, let's, let's, pick, up, let's pick up on that. I, I just want to just uh, follow up on Tina McQueen's point, actually, uh, with, with Senator Keneally, because, um, uh, you know, the, the, the point really that 
the Liberals have been very successful at getting back into office. Mm. Uh, there are other issues above, yes, right. above the women's issue and may yes. well be even, you know, Labour uh, odds on to win federally mm. this year, but may not be because everybody wants more women in Parliament. Mm. Well, you know, <laughs> I think the question we haven't really uh, discussed is the so what? What does it matter if mm. you have more women mm. in politics? And yeah, there are the presentational issues and there's the, the, the um, you know, for example, there are the, 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 the holding someone up. You know, I remember when Julia Gillard became Prime Minister, I went to a school in my electorate that night for a presentation night, and these little girls came running out, and they said, Miss, Miss, girls are in charge everywhere. And I thought, how great to be nine or ten and yes. see your nation and your state being led by someone who looked like you, yeah. uh, and certainly not something in my generation I had the benefit of seeing. Uh, so, yeah, they're the presentational issues, but I think there are also the policy issues. And, uh, you know, the, what I would uh, 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 bet is that right now there are a number of important policy issues that Labour are prosecuting to benefit women that will be appealing to the electorate. And I think that is in part because we have such a strong, a strong number of women in cabinet uh, and in the parliament to advocate for those. Karina, um, do you want to pick up on that? So, you know, and if you don't agree with us, as Chris Bowen said the other day, don't vote for us. Um, <laughs> you know, but that's the policy platform uh, that's a key part. You know, and Bill has made women's, particularly women's economic security and inequ the inequality that they face a key part of our election offering, and if we win, mm. uh, we will have a, a mandate to implement Karina, that. to policy issues, uh, number one, are the, uh, what are the pol difference in the policy issues? And number two, does it sure. matter whether it's men or women delivering those policies? Look, issues? I find that position, in fact, demeaning. It presupposes that women are only good for pushing um, certain policy issues. And unless you have women who are there in parliament, then you will have an absence of uh, a voice to push policy issues. And I think what is being inferred is that it's the soft, fuzzy issues, um, the family issues and things like that that women are good for. And without, mm. without having women uh, in parliament that you won't have uh, strong policy development in that space. Mm. Uh, I think that's something that um, really puts down the contribution that women are able to make. I think men and women can make a huge contribution across a broad range of policy right. areas, and it's not about their gender, it's about their background, their experience. Uh, men have yes. sisters, have wives, have uh, grandparents as well as women. All right, have Eugenie, can I give you the last word? <laughs> Look, I, I think. I think the representation of women in parliament, it does matter to people, but I think the, the, the risk is that, it, that, an obs that a focus on quotas can descend into what, what I would call gender-based tribalism, and we don't want to promote that in Australia. Mm. Okay, right. Tiki, before well, we well, wrap well. things up, can we just take one, more, one last question from Alicia Heath. She's the CEO of Women for Election Australia. She was also an independent candidate in the recent Wentworth by-election. Alicia. Thanks, Tom, and thank you, everybody. Lots of questions, but I'll, I'll keep it to one. Um, the pipeline of women coming into politics is obviously an issue, and, and the public are onto it, maybe, maybe less so the party so far. Um, another issue is once women get into that role, whether it's state government or whether it's federal government, mm. is sustaining them there. So support networks to keep women there. Women's attrition out of politics is very, very high. Mm. Um, there's been talk about a women's caucus at the federal level. Are you supportive of a women's caucus in Canberra? Uh, are we talking about, uh, are we talking about within the Liberal Party or cross party? Cross party. Yeah. Senator Keneally. Uh, you're right, Liz, here to point out the need to sustain women. I, I, and, you know, I, I'm not entirely sure I agree, can agree on the Labor side that the attrition of women is incredibly high. Um, I haven't seen the figures, but I just I was running anecdotally through my head and, and I would, I would, I'd be interested to look at that because I'm not sure it's the case. And again, I think that comes back back to the idea of having critical mass there. Uh, and that makes such a big difference. You know, when I was first elected in New South Wales um, in 2003, three of the first 13 women ever elected to the New South Wales Parliament were still there. I mean, that's extraordinary. 
um, in 1988, only I think only 1988, 13 women had been elected, and and the reason I use that is because 1988, six had gotten elected. There had only been seven up to that point, so it's the slow burn. So when I got there in 2003, we were the biggest cohort ever elected, and it was amazing to be part of like 25 percent women in the parliament, and that does matter. Um, I would say to some extent there is a uh, informal kind of networking that happens amongst the women. I remember um, the night they were um, toppling Malcolm, you know, running into one of my liberal female colleagues and giving her a big hug and having a quick chat. Um, you know, Kelly O'Dwyer wrote me a lovely note when I first got there and I wrote one back. And you know, like there is an informal gathering. The, the, cha the problem with formalizing those kinds of things in a place like Canberra, a hothouse atmosphere, is it? they become problematic in other ways. Yeah. Um, Karina, would you like to comment on that? I think that, that, yeah. that yeah. the extent to which women recognize and support one another um, in what can be a challenging environment can be really important. Yeah. I would, I suppose, like start by asking for what purpose. I think if, pe if uh, forums don't have a purpose and an agenda, then it can be uh, tokenism, uh, where people could be uh, spending their time and. Uh, placing their time in things that might be uh, a better way forward to contribute to what I think people are there for in Parliament, which is to change po policy, to change laws, to better our country. So my question would be, for to what end? Mm. And do you think the sisterhood in uh, Canberra is a supportive place? Or do you think the old cliche about, you know, you're there and, uh, you know, you want some daylight? Uh, underneath you? I think works. broadly in Canberra it's pretty cutthroat. I think that the sisterhood, certainly in the Liberal Party, um, they are fighters, they are tough women and I think just as our men are, tough men. Mm. Um, but do they help each other up? No. <laughs> 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 mm. I think in a competitive environment um, across the board, regardless of gender, um, that is a, a challenge but at mm. the end of the day that competitive environment hopefully produces and results in uh, the cream rising to the top and merit really having a role to um, play in terms of providing the Australian people with the best possible leadership. And we have that in Scott Morrison right now. Don't change it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> what a great ending. Over okay. to you, Tom. <laughs> well, CIS is very privileged to have a, a great uh, distinguished board of directors. And I'd like to call on one of our board members, Alison Watkins, to give the vote of thanks. Alison is the managing director of Coca-Cola Amateur. Please welcome Alison. Thanks very much, Tom. And well, that certainly wasn't one of those panels where everyone violently agreed with each other <laughs> or where it was really hard to dredge up a few questions at the end, was it? And I think um, first and foremost, that's a great testament to um, the wonderful moderator that we had in Tiki. Um, I've had the dubious pleasure of being on the receiving end of a few ticky interrogations in my <laughs> in my career, and uh, you know, like I, I think uh, Tiki, you just did an outstanding job of really creating an engaging discussion and getting to the heart of the issues. And also, I think you can see how uh, incredibly well prepared um, Tiki was. So, thank you, Tiki. Um, kind of hard to, um, to pull any um, conclusions out of that one, isn't it? Um, and I'm very conscious that this is such a, you know, we all have um, such personal views and takes on this. So I'm really sure that this discussion helped us develop our thinking. I know for my, my own reflections, I do feel troubled by um, the, the concept that we end up with democratically elected representatives who, when you look at them, don't actually seem to be that representative. That just doesn't feel right to me. And I also know from my own experience in the corporate world and in challenging ourselves to create greater diversity of all kinds, but including gender diversity, that it is so important to get to the root cause, um, to get to the the underlying issues um, that are creating, um, you know, a pool to select from that is not representative of the broader group. So it seems to me that getting to the heart of membership, um, of pre-selection processes, 
um, of even going back into um, schools and universities and what is it that is um, causing women or other, um, other representatives of the community not to get engaged. That's a really, really important thing. And I think we all look at um, the change that the, um, that the Labor Party have driven. Um, you know, certainly uh, it's, it's, it's very apparent and I certainly look at it with admiration. Um, however, I also, like many of you, um, am wary of quotas and, um, and, and the panel, I think, um, Karina and Eugenie did a very good job of pointing out some of the risks and the, and the concerns um, that we would have and should have about an excessive use of quotas to drive that change or an excessive reliance on that. But I think as Christina said, um, it can be um, a device as part of an overall focus on change that does cause you to consider um, the pools that you are drawing from and how you can broaden those pools and also the criteria that you're using to define merit and how you can challenge yourselves against what your definition of merit actually is. So ultimately it seems to me that um, political parties, um, you know, to win power and to have the influence and, and be the change that they want to be, they have to be relevant um, and they have to attract people obviously to vote for them. And um, ultimately it seems to me that um, political parties to survive and thrive and be six successful, um, they need to listen and respond to their constituency. So I think we'll all be um, very much uh, watching that process with a great deal of interest. And, and maybe uh, some of us um, will decide you know, to be part of that change and clearly there are people in this audience today who have already made that decision and that's, that's uh, um, you know, inspiring to see. Um, and uh, on that note, I would, I would urge you, uh, those of you who are not familiar with the Centre for Independent Studies, um, or maybe this is the first event that you've come along to, to consider joining up. Um, it's a, it's a, a wonderful organisation to be part of and it really does help you um, get a little bit more informed um, in a non-partisan way about issues that matter and um, just to get a bit more engaged. And uh, yeah, who knows, we need more women too, I think. <laughs> so um, we, we'd love to encourage you to get involved. <laughs> and uh, uh, and uh, yeah, who knows, maybe it might also inspire you to get more involved in politics one day as well. So thanks very much, everyone.